Hello, everyone, and welcome to Boston Balling. I'm your host, Gabby Hurlbut. Happy holidays. I have to start with that. Uh, Christmas is re here this weekend and then New Year is coming up. So hope everyone, uh, you know, finished their last minute Christmas shopping um, and it has everything ready to go. And I hope everyone's looking forward to seeing their families. I, I know I'm looking forward to seeing mine that I haven't gotten to see in a while. So that'll be really nice. So happy Tuesday. Hope everyone's off to a good start to the week. It's a short week this week. So like we can all look forward to that as well. Um, I'm excited to be here with you all. Um, I have a really special guest with me today. Red Sox minor league baseball coach, Bianca Smith. How are you doing today? I'm great, Gabby. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I'm really looking forward to, um, you know, talking to you today uh, just about your experience and and your story. So it's I'm definitely looking forward to having people hear from you today. I'm looking forward to it as well. Hopefully it's uh, entertaining. <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely will be. Um, yeah. So I was just saying that we were just talking right before we got on air, how you have a lot of traveling to do for the holidays. <laughs> yeah, uh, traveling to visit family. Um, I'll be visiting family in Pittsburgh for Christmas and then even just off season traveling, just uh, going to conventions and actually even taking vacations. I finally took my first vacation in about four years. A couple oh, nice. Years Where, where'd you go? Uh, first one, I took a train from Fort Worth, Texas to LA and then back. And then the second one was actually Orlando. So I went to Disney World and Universal Studios. <laughs> That's awesome. I haven't been. I the last time I think I was in Disney World was when I was in high school. Same. That and so, I'm a huge Disney fan, so I was super excited to be able to finally go again. Yeah, no, it's been so long for me too. But were were the how were the lines and everything at the parks? Were they crazy? They weren't too bad, depending on what time you got there. But one of the joys of um, going by yourself. Lines aren't as big of a problem because it's just you. And I'm not a huge fan of roller coasters or like thrill rides. So I didn't really have to worry about too many lines, the rides and the shows that I wanted to see. It's like a 15 minute wait. So it worked out really well for me. <laughs> That's really good. Yeah. I remember the last time I was there, the lines were painful. Yeah. I'm sure if you're sorry, <clears throat> I'm sure if you're going with a bunch of people or again, depending on what time you go, the lines could be pretty bad. But um, I also went early December. So it actually wasn't as crowded as it normally would have been like if I tried to go now. Yeah, yeah. Because going now around the holidays is such a popular time to go to. You want to go during like off times of the year yeah. when there's not a lot of people there when, you know, school is going on and a lot of people aren't taking vacations at that time. Yeah, I went Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So it was yeah. Perfect. Monday was a little crowded, but that's because I went to Magic Kingdom and everybody goes there. Exactly. Yeah. They were perfect. That's like the go-to park, I feel like. That's like the most yeah. popular one. <laughs> that's awesome, though. I'm, I'm glad you were able to do that. And it's nice that you'll be able to go and see your family in other states for the holidays. Luckily, most of my family is right near me. So we just it's just a matter of driving to somebody's house, usually, which is really convenient. Well, I understand that, too. I'm living with my uh, parents during the off season, so I get to see them all the time. <laughs> that's nice. Yeah, no, my uh, yeah, that's nice. My parents live uh, pretty close to me, too. So it's nice to just be able to see everyone. But yeah, I hope you have a, you know, a good holiday also while we were on that topic. But I appreciate you joining me on the show. Um, I did kind of want to start with by just asking you kind of um, what really started your love and interest um, in baseball. Yeah, so my mom introduced me to the game when I was three or four years old. She was a, sorry, Red Sox fan. She was a diehard Yankees fan. Oh, no. <laughs> so I grew up rooting for the Yankees and the Pirates because my uh, stepdad's like fourth or fifth generation from Pittsburgh, too. So oh, wow. that's, and we're not even a huge baseball family. My mom was the biggest fan. My sister kind of caught on to the fandom as well, so she'll go to games with me. But other than that, it's not like we went to baseball games. We just occasionally watched them on TV. But my mom used to joke that I have this thing where I find something I'm really passionate about and I take it to an almost obsessive level where I just learn as much as I can. I research it and I just become fascinated by it. And baseball was one of them. So even without having games on, I think the first professional game I actually went to, I was nine. And I, really? yeah, and I, and that was only because the Yankees came. Um, so I grew up in Texas. The Yankees came to play the Rangers, and my dad got free tickets. So he's like, "Great, we're gonna go see the Yankees play." And 
after that, I think my next game wasn't until I was like 14 or 15. So <laughs> we did not go to games very often, but I still, I love the strategy. I love the fact that you didn't have to be the best athlete on the field to be the best player. Like if you understood the game and you took advantage of what your skills were, you could still be a really good player. And I think that really resonated with me just because I, despite having played multiple sports, I am the least athletic of all my siblings. So it was kind of nice. It's like, great. This is a sport that, I mean, I didn't play it until I was older, but I'm like, this is a sport that I could play. This is a sport I can understand. I loved the strategy. I love being able to think it through. So I just, yeah, I just fell in love with it. That's so awesome. Yeah. Baseball is a great sport in that way. And I also love that, you know, even just as a team, you could have the best players on paper, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can, that you're going to be a championship team. Cause a lot yeah. of times we see, you know, teams that don't necessarily have like the be most talent on paper on their roster, but they come together and they have that chemistry and they can win together because everybody knows their role and everybody contributes. And that's the cool thing about baseball that I feel like, any team, you know, especially at the end of the season could come into like the playoffs and just um, go on a run that nobody expected because they just all came together at the right time and everybody knows their role. And that's what I really like about it. Oh, same. That's one of the things that I love to um, coach our players too. I remember telling, so my last job at Carroll, I remember telling our guys at the beginning of our 2020 season, I mean, they were down because I think we were 0-4, 0-5 or something. And I just told them, guys, the game isn't over until you think it's over. I mean, that's the joy of the game. It's not timed. It's not like, you know, football or basketball where you have a certain score and you only have two minutes left and you're like, oh, no, game's done. I'm like, you could have literally just one out left and still come back. So yeah. until you think you're done, game's not over. But it's the moment that you think you're done, that's when you've truly lost the game. And that pumped them up. And then the next game, we beat an undefeated team. Wow. Cool. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. That's why I love baseball because like it literally, it's not to quote Yogi Bear, it's not over till it's over. <laughs> yeah, it is. It really is a mental thing too, like you're saying, because a lot of times, yeah, I mean, it's being able to play that is that longevity of being able to play for the full nine innings of a baseball game, but being able to keep your mind in it the entire time and be like, okay, yeah, like we have three outs to go, but we like until the last out is made, like anything's still possible. Like I remember like the Red Sox with the Mother's Day miracle when they came back and they, they it was the bottom of the ninth with two outs and they had, they had like this crazy comeback. And that was a game that you look at at that point in the game and you say, yeah, this is over. Like there's no way that they're going to come back. But then you look at situations like that and it's like, well, yeah, that's just proof that the game really isn't over until until it's, you know, until it really actually officially is over when the last out is made. Yeah, I never understood fans who leave in like the ninth inning because they think the team's done. I'm like, are you kidding me? There's there's still, there's like so much can happen in with, yeah, with two outs. Like I've seen yeah. it happen with us this season. Like we actually did really well when there were two outs. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the things that drew me to the game, but yeah, like I said, my mom was the one who initially introduced me, and then I just kind of took it to the next level. That's awesome, yeah. And, I mean, once you find those interests and you kind of lock in on it, you know, then you can, you know, you, you can really just do things with it. And you obviously committed to it because you were like, yeah, I have a passion for the game of baseball, and then you made it happen, you know? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, kind of, what kind of made you realize you wanted to get involved in the coaching side? So I, yeah, I didn't really think about it. Um, when I initially wanted to get into baseball, it was my sophomore year of college. So I was 18, um, kind of explored around, tried to figure out, okay, where in baseball do I fit the best? And I knew I wanted to be on the baseball side. I wanted to be involved with the team, with the players. And um, seeing as I hadn't seen another woman coaching, my first thought was actually general manager because I'd seen women assistant GMs. So I'm like, okay, this is something that I'd be able to do. Um, it wasn't until I got to Case Western as a grad student that I started working on the field with the players and discovered how much I love being on the field, working drills, like being in the trenches, being in the dugout. But having gone to Case Western for grad school, having told so many people that I wanted to be a GM, I stuck with that because that's kind of what the expectation was, despite the fact that I 
kind of had an inkling that I wanted to be on the field instead, but still tried it out, got my internship with the Rangers. And between that and my internship in the commissioner's office, that's when I really realized I don't want to be in an office. I don't want to be behind a computer all day. I don't even want to be in business casual. So <laughs> I, I knew that that's what I finally accepted. I'm like, I, I hate the fact that there's so many people who have this expectation, but I don't want to do this anymore. I want to coach. I want to be on the field. I want to be helping the players directly. So yeah, I kind of, like I said, I had an inkling um, when I was at Case Western, but I didn't finally accept it until a couple of years later. And which is funny because even with all those internships, I'd still been coaching on the side for fun. So I was still doing what I loved. I just never really thought about making it my actual living. Yeah, you just were like, yeah, I like doing this and it's I really enjoy it. But you just had it, that thought hadn't crossed your mind of like, oh, I could actually genuinely make a career on yeah. doing this. Yeah, that's such an interesting story, though, because, yeah, like you said, I mean, sitting in an office all day, you know, going into your job nine to five, like looking, you know, wearing nice, nice uh, business shirts and everything like that and going and sitting down and working like and just staying at your desk like that. That's not appealing to everybody. You know what I mean? So if you can do something that doesn't involve that, I feel like that's ideal. Well, it's funny. Even before I knew I wanted to work in baseball, I never wanted a nine to five. Like since I was a kid, really? I grew up wanting to be a veterinarian. Like oh, wow. I didn't have something where I was sitting all day or like I wanted to be moving. I wanted to be able to use my hands. I wanted to be interactive. I couldn't just sit. And that, like I said, since I was a kid, like there's no way I would have been happy with the nine to five job. I would just get bored too quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you just knew you were like, that's not for me. And I'm going to do something that doesn't involve that a hundred percent. I know that. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And and I mean, obviously, like, they always say, if you love what you do, it doesn't feel like work. And so I feel like you found something that you're truly passionate about. So you genuinely like going to work every day, you know? Oh, uh, it's very true. And this is coming from someone I'm not a morning person at all. I'm not either. I'm still at the call, you know, 6, 630 in the morning. I have no problem. Actually, I take that back. I do still have a problem waking up. I have no <laughs> problem actually getting up and going to work, though. So yeah, I still like, have to when set your alarm my- goes off, you're like, yeah, oh. I, I don't like this, but yeah, no, I have to set my alarm every 15 minutes for about an hour before I finally get up. So <laughs> my alarm will start going off at like 4 30 in the morning, but I'm not out of bed until about six. <laughs> you're like, yeah, I'm not dying. I feel bad for my neighbors because it's probably loud. It's going off every 15 minutes. I'm like, that's what it takes to actually wake me up. But once I'm up, I love going into work. I love being there. I mean, I tell people it's 10 to 12 hours a day and that's if we're at home and it's still amazing. Like the first couple of weeks I had people asking me how I was adjusting to the schedule, how I was adjusting to the long hours. And I was like, I actually have more time now than I did in my last job. Like my, the last place I was at, I was working three jobs and doing 16 hours a day. So having this extra four to six hours, it's amazing. (laughs) And I'm actually spending those 10 to 12 hours, all 10 to 12 12 hours, I'm actually enjoying what I'm doing. So yeah, it doesn't feel like work. See, that's the biggest thing about it too. And that's what everyone hopes to find, I think, is is really feeling that way, that when you're at work, you're constantly enjoying everything that you're doing and and just being able to be there with the players and watch them develop, I feel like is cool too, you know? Totally worth it. I mean, yeah, it's not easy. It's definitely hard work, but that's also the joy of it. I've told people, as soon as it becomes easy, that's when I need to quit. And I don't think it ever will be because that's the joy of coaching is there's always a challenge. You're always trying to figure out how to help a player get better. And you have so many different types of players. There's never just one answer. And that's what's so much fun. But yeah, as soon as it starts to get easy, that's when I get bored. Like I like being challenged every day. I like being able to go in and yes, see these players get better. I mean, the moment something clicks with the player, it's amazing seeing it on their face. They're like, oh, okay, got it. And then seeing that actually translate to the field and seeing their performance get better. And then seeing a guy get called up. I mean, like that's that's why you do 10 to 12 hours. I mean, that's why it's it's totally worth it getting to see that. Yeah, I was gonna bring that up too. That like if some of your players get called up, like how cool of a feeling is that to be sitting there seeing that and be like, Well, look at how much like this players come because you see them, you know 
in a very different spot than like when we see them, when we're watching them on TV, like when they do get called up type thing or like something like that, like how, what does that mean to you? I'll admit it's a little bittersweet actually. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, sure. the, the biggest part of me is so excited because then also getting like, we get to watch them throughout their minor league career too. I mean, we have, uh, we can watch their games. So getting to see how they do after they leave us, but it's also like them leaving it's kind of weird because you're like, okay, now I'm going to miss this kid because <laughs> I've worked, I've spent so much time with them. I've gotten to know him. And now like you want to check up on them and make sure they're doing okay. I mean, that's as coaches, we all keep in touch with each other. One of our guys gets called up or even if something happens and a guy gets called down, your coach, you're going to hear from the other coach and kind of just let him know, Hey, this is what he was working on. This is what you need to, you know, pay attention to look out for. So it's not like we, you know, they get sent up and we just never talk to them again. Like we're still keeping in touch with them. So, I mean, it's awesome getting to see them, you know, progress. And the moment that they find out that they're getting called up and they come to you and they're just like, thank you. My first response is usually like, I, I didn't do anything. This was all you. Like this, it's, yeah. it's amazing seeing the look on their face when they finally get that call up and then getting to see them progress even further. It's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And it definitely makes the job worth it. Yeah, because that's the point, I feel like, where they realize, like, yeah, this, you know, my my hard work is paying off and I'm getting to where I want to go. And I feel like just being able to see those reactions from them when they get that call and they find out, like, that they're getting to go to that next level, I feel like is super cool. Yeah, it is. I mean, this is what their goal is. And obviously, as coaches, our goal is to help them achieve their goals. I mean, we're succeeding as well once players get called up. Because that means we're doing our job and helping them get to where they want to be. Exactly. Yeah. Because from your perspective, it's probably like, yeah, you have to help them grow individually, but also be working to see team success, too. So you're like, yeah, like I see what, you know, what this person's struggles were throughout their career that like, you know, led them to where they are now. Yeah. That, that must be so that must be so cool. But yeah, I, can, I definitely get how you're like, oh, I'm going to miss them. Like this is so <laughs> <laughs> you know, I you know. know them so well. I explained um, after spring training, once guys went to their affiliates, I explained it like the last day of school where you're super excited for them or like graduation, like you're super excited for them because they get to go off and do great things. <laughs> really going to miss them. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good comparison too. that. It's like my high school graduation when it was like, yeah, I'm leaving and I'm going to college and like my teachers were all probably like, oh, I'm so happy for these kids. But at the same time, they were like, oh, like we're going to miss them. Like we yep. work with them, you know, so that I, that's an interesting comparison, though. <laughs> what do you what do you kind of feel? Because um, obviously baseball is a very much like, um, you know, like we talked about before, like a mental game. Um, so how do you kind of keep the players focused? Um, maybe if they're going through like a bad slump during the season, if they hit like a streak where they're just losing some games and they can't seem to, you know, figure things out. Cause we, we do see that um, a lot. It just happens. It's a long season, you know, and it's, it's sometimes they, if, if they go through one of those, like, you know, streaks where they maybe are losing a few games, like how do you kind of keep them motivated and focused to get out of that slump? Well, it really depends on the player. Um, and what they respond to. But some players, it's you know, just showing them success even at practice, uh, putting them in a situation where they can succeed and just kind of reminding them like they have the skill. Just because they have a couple of bad games doesn't mean they're a bad player. Others, it's um, reminding them of what they have already done and kind of going back and saying, hey, like before you had the slump, this is what you were doing. So obviously you can do it again. We just need to get you back to that point. And then some players, it's um, – oh, I had it in my head. Was, I had it in my head. I, don't, I forgot what I was going to – I forgot what I was going to say. It's okay. Yeah, yeah well, I need that happen. Practice, uh, showing them what they've done. Um, others, I mean, some are as easy as just kind of talking, them, talking through with them. And uh, – just again, kind of, it's really just a reminder of letting them know, like they're here for a reason. They're not bad athletes. And actually, so sometimes it's also a comparison. I've had players where they have a bad, yeah, they have, they, they go through a slump. They've got a couple of bad games and I actually just kind of remind them, Hey, 
guys who have made it to the majors have done the exact same thing. Guys who have made it to the majors have actually done worse. So you're actually, you're not in a bad spot. So sometimes comparing that too, but a lot of it is really just like reminding them that they do have the ability. Baseball is a game of failure. You're going to fail. And if you don't, I mean, actually, I mean we've never had a player that didn't fail. Like, People, some coaches don't like saying it's a game of failure, but if you think about it, you fail seven out of 10 times and you're an all-star. So really it's not, how do you succeed those three out of 10 times? It's how do you come back from failing the seven out of 10? And then just, again, just kind of reminding players, like you're not a bad player just because you fail. It's how you respond to that failure. If you're going to continue to fail, that's, that's when you start, that's when we have an issue. And then might, we might have to think of some other way to get them through it. Some guys, it's that's why you, like, you see some guys who, you know, first round picks who don't make it, not because they don't have the skill, but mentally they just cannot wrap their head around failing and not being the best anymore or how to get past being the best. And unfortunately, there are some guys where it's just mentally, it's just too difficult for them to get through because they're not used to failing. So like I said, there's multiple ways that you can kind of work around that. You just kind of have to figure out what works best for the player and just kind of work from there. Um, I have found, I mean, just kind of putting them in positions to be successful, like similar situations to a game, but where they can actually be successful might be able to bring up their confidence a little bit more. And that tends to help because confidence is one of the biggest pieces. I've told her, um, I've told my hitters at my last job, one of the most important um, things about being a hitter is knowing and thinking that you can hit like it doesn't matter how good your swing is if you don't think you can hit you're not gonna hit I mean that's why you see guys who have terrible swings but still make contact and still get hits because they get up in the box thinking I'm gonna hit this ball like confidence is such a big part so it's just bringing that confidence back and getting that player in a good mindset again that even if he continues to fail he'll continue to fight and continue to push and those are like those are the players that you want. Yeah, I think that's really well said. And and I feel like it's it's so true. Even at the major league level, you see players that, you know, just don't work out. They get to the major league level and then they um, you know, they'll try it out, but then they just won't work out. Like, you know, they'll get they'll get released or something because they weren't really cutting it. And it's not necessarily because of their skill. It's more because, you know, mentally they can't they can't really overcome that diversity of being yeah. like oh I had a bad game here and with that pressure I feel like of being in the majors when so many people are watching you every day when you're playing that's a hard situation to be in too so I feel like you see players that get to that point and then they just emotionally can't handle all the pressure that comes with that and don't really know how to overcome that or bounce back if they have a bad game yeah I mean, it's, it's honestly amazing how much coaching gets done just by talking with the players, like nothing to do with the skill development or anything actually on the field. Like so much of it is mental. And that's such a huge part that, again, sometimes it's just as simple as just talking with the players and talking them through what they're going through. Yeah. And that's one thing I've always said about, um, you know, Alex Cora as a manager, as I feel like he's a very much like a player's coach and he actually can, um, you know, really help each player individually and seems to understand how to connect with his players, which keeps them, you know, really motivated and they all love playing together. And if, I mean, if you look at teams like the Red Sox, like they weren't the best team on paper last year and look at how far they went. And I feel like that's a big part of that too, is the coaching because you need to have a coach. I feel like that can relate to the players and be able to find those conversations that they can have with them that they can really connect to, to be able to carry that further into their career. And I feel like that's so important in baseball. And I feel like doesn't get talked about enough um, just how important the coaching aspect is and what you're actually saying to the players to be able to get them to keep moving forward. No, it's true. A lot of the focus is on the actual skill and what you see on the field. But it is, yeah, it's very important, like what's going on behind the scenes too, how we're interacting with our players. And that's one of like one of the biggest parts of coaching. I've had somebody ask, um, do you find that you feel like you're, 
dealing with the mental side of the game as much as you're dealing with the physical side. I'm like, probably more. I mean, we're, especially you get to a certain point skill wise where these guys are like, they're better than us. <laughs> we already <laughs> know that. I mean, yeah. they're to the rookie level. They're probably, they're better than us. There's so, a reason they're there. Yeah. yeah. Like skill wise, there's, um, there's a lot of players where there's not a lot we have to do. Sure, there's some tweaks we might have to make uh, depending on the player. I mean, yeah, when they're younger, you know, build up some more strength, get them to adjust to that. But I tell them, like, you're as a coach, a good portion of my job is just being a psychiatrist and just talking with them. I yeah. think you're teaching a lot of times, like, you're teaching fundamentals. And you're not really even teaching them. They know the fundamentals. It's just getting them to continue practicing them. And yeah. then even with hitting, I'm like, again, you might change a little bit of the swing, but it's more just the repetition. Like that's what practice is for baseball. It's the repetition, getting that um, muscle memory in. And then the other side of it is just making sure mentally they're in the game. So it is such a huge part that I agree. It's not really talked about because it's not really thought about. Yeah. That's so interesting. You say psychiatrist, but I could totally see that though. Just, you know, talking to them. Cause if they have something going on in their personal lives, like, you know, we all have things in our personal lives that come up and like that maybe could be a distraction to them and their game. I feel like that's something that if they trust you enough, they could be able to open up to you about something like that. And then you could be like, you know, you could try to help them through it. Um, and hopefully that'll help them, you know, refocus themselves for games. Yeah, and that is definitely a big part as well. Um, a lot of times, you know, when players go through slumps, it has nothing to do with their physical aspects. It is, yeah, it, it's mental, and sometimes it is something that's going on off the field that we need to talk about. But, yeah, you got to build up that relationship and that trust with the player that they can start talking to you about stuff outside of baseball too. Yeah, and that's – and that that's see, that's interesting though because, yeah, I mean, we know everybody has things in their personal lives outside of work that – you know, might come up or if they're struggling through something. And a lot of times you don't think that that's something that they would be willing to open up about um, because when they're at, when they're at practice or they're at baseball, it's like, okay, I'm here for baseball and baseball only, but I feel like more of them are willing to open up about other things going on in their lives to people that they actually trust. And they're willing to talk about that stuff with, because I feel like in a lot of situations, you don't think that, they can talk about that stuff when they're at baseball practice. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's another big part of being a coach. Like I said, building that relationship, building that trust. Like as long as players have at least one coach on staff that they can talk to, that's a good start. Yeah. Cause then, then just knowing that they can open up to you and you can kind of help them try to help them through whatever's going on. And one of the things that it seems like is that you're good at relating to people and I feel like that's probably one of the biggest things that makes you such a good coach is because you're able to just relate to them. And, and that's like the most important thing and be like, oh, look, like I understand, you know, um, why you might feel this way about this. You know what I mean? And I feel like knowing that you can relate to them is is, is probably the most important thing. I certainly try. Um, I think like one of the things that I bring in is, yes, being able to relate to them. But there are I'm going to be honest, there's a lot of things that I don't go through that yeah. they do. So part of it is also just being willing to listen and being open and letting them feel comfortable enough to be able to share. And uh, I think like one of the things I got, especially you know, I majored in sociology when I was at Dartmouth. So being able to read people and learn, like understand how they react and how they function based on, you know, how they were raised or the environment that they're in. Things like that, I think, is what I've been able to bring in. So even if I can't directly relate to a situation because I'd never been through it, I can still at least talk them through it and try to understand what they're going through. And I think that still helps with players just having a coach who they know they can just kind of talk to. I mean, because there are players who they don't really need an answer. They just need to be able to talk. Like they don't want somebody trying to solve everything. They just kind of want to – there's players who just want to vent and that makes them feel better. So again, just being even like they're players who we haven't gotten to that point and that's fine. That's why I said, as long as there's one coach on staff that they're comfortable with, then that's good. It's not always going to be the same coach. Not every single player is going to gravitate towards me and that's fine. But as long as I'm there for the ones who do want to talk, like that's what's important. Yeah, no, for sure. And that makes sense. And, um, you know, 
it's definitely one of those types of situations where, yeah, like a lot of times people are just like, yeah, I just want somebody to listen to me and I just want to be able to let this out. And then that'll make me feel better for, you know, going forward. And I feel like a lot of times, even with me, like sometimes I'm like, yeah, like, let's talk this through. Like, let's see, maybe this person has advice for me. But other times I'm just like, honestly, like, I just need to just talk for like five minutes about what's going on right now. And a lot of times, like if, if one of my friends or whoever it is really they'll just sit there and they'll listen and I'm fine with that. And that's, you know what I mean? And I feel like in these cases, sometimes that is what it is too. And as long as they know that they have that option, I feel like that's important. And it's amazing. I don't think people think about too, just how much that actually translates to the skill development part of coaching, because at least a lot of my philosophy is making sure that players are involved in their own development. Like they take charge. I tell guys that my job as a coach is actually to make myself obsolete. Like they shouldn't need me after a while. If anything, they might need me as like a sounding board to bounce off ideas or again, just to be that person that they need to talk to. But I encourage our players, like if we're working on something new, I need them to be comfortable enough to tell me that it's not working. Like I don't want players who are just like, okay, yeah, I'll try it. And then just, it doesn't work, but they don't say anything. So I'm going to assume that, okay, great. It's working out. Yeah. I want them to not only be able to be comfortable enough to tell me that it's not working, but also if they come up with an idea that I didn't, I want them to be able to think it through and, you know, come come to me and say, hey, I have this idea. Why don't we try this? And I'm perfectly happy to go, OK, yeah, if you, as long as you have a reason for why you want to do this, I have no problem with trying it because at least as long as we try it, it might work. It might not work. If it doesn't work, great. We'll try something else. But at least now we know. But yeah. basically, my only rule is you just need a reason for it. If there's no reason for you to do it, then why are we doing it? It's just kind of a waste of time. And it's the same thing for me. Like, I don't give a drill unless I have a reason behind it. And I'll make sure to explain to the players, like, this is why we're doing this right now. So it's, I try to have a very open relationship where it's a conversation. Like, if coaching isn't just telling players what to do. Coaching is an actual, it's a back and forth conversation because they should be the ones involved in their own development. They should be able to go off and work on their own skill development and come up with ideas that works for them and then come to me and say, Hey, what do you think about this? And we'll talk it out. Like that's yeah, really like, Oh, if I like, Oh, I feel like this isn't really working for me. Can we try this instead? Yes. So that's why like, yeah, we can try it. Build that relationship because I want them to, again, be comfortable enough to be able to say, no, this isn't working. And a lot of players, they're so used to coaches just telling them, Hey, do this without yeah. any other actual instruction that they feel like they have to. Like I've had players who they were scared of telling me that it wasn't working out until I finally pushed them. And they're like, okay, yeah, well, can I try this instead? And that actually worked better. Like coaches don't know everything. So sometimes like the players, it's their body, it's their career. They're going to know, they're actually going to know better than we do how they feel. We're not going to know unless they actually tell us. So how are we, we can't help them we can't get them to their fullest potential if they don't tell us what they're actually feeling as well. We can really only guess based on what we're seeing, based on the numbers. And again, and we might think something's working and it's not. They might actually be getting really good numbers, but they're incredibly uncomfortable doing something, not because it's new, but like maybe because body-wise, they physically, it's just uncomfortable for them to do it. And we might be looking at their numbers going, oh, great, they're actually improving a little bit, thinking, great, this works. Whereas for them, they're like, this is just physically after six months, it still doesn't feel right. I'm like, well, then that's not going to help you. Like, we needed to be doing something else. Like, you need to be able to tell us that this isn't working out and not be afraid that we're going to get upset because you're not doing what we said. Like, that's not how the relationship should work. <laughs> And I feel like there are plenty of coaches that are like that, though, where they're like, yeah, no, we're going to do this my way and that's it. And they're, they're not really willing to hear out the players. And I feel like that's why players can get really frustrated with coaches that they have because they're like, well, like I, this, I don't feel like this is helping me, but their coach isn't willing to really hear them out when at the end of the day, they're the player and they're inside their own body. Nobody else is, you know, so nobody else can tell them like, this is comfortable or uncomfortable physically for you. You know, they have to be the ones to be able to say that. Exactly. 
Yeah. And so I, it's good that you have, you know, that kind of relationship with um, the players. So how do you kind of, um, you know, during the off season, make sure that they're kind of keeping up with everything and that they're still, um, you know, that they're still on track for um, the next season, like not only just physically with their skills, but even mentally that they're just everything still, you know, going well with them in their lives outside of baseball. Yeah. So I mean, skill wise, our player development department, pretty much takes care of that. Now we, ch we have check-ins during the off season, make sure they're doing okay. Um, I'll text a couple of guys and just kind of check in with them, but I'll say social media is a great way to keep an eye on your guys too. <laughs> getting to see like, what they're doing. Um, and it's really cool. I mean, getting to see like special moments in their lives, like when they get married or, you know, have an anniversary, get to go on vacation, get to see family, things like that. Um, uh, but I will text a couple of guys, you know, especially ones like if I work with them really closely during the season and I know like this might be a guy that I got to keep an eye on. I'll check up, check up on him. Um, that's mainly at least for my port part. That's what we do. But I mean, I like I follow as many guys as I can because there's a lot that they'll put on social media that they won't tell you directly. Yeah, I'll still yeah. get to see what's going on in their lives. <laughs> And yeah, because, you know, once we hit spring training, I get to come back and we get to, I can bring up like different things that I saw and ask him, hey, how was this? Or, hey, congratulations, you got married over the offseason. Um, I'll say yeah. congratulations on their post or I might shoot them a text, but getting to actually see them in person and getting to talk about things that happen in their life. It also shows them like we actually care. It's it's not as going, oh, great, you're gone for the offseason and that's it. Come back and actually pull up things that happen and getting to talk to them about what happened outside of baseball for you. Yeah. To show that you're interested in what they're doing outside of baseball and you're not here as just like, you know, yeah, I'm your baseball coach. So I don't really care what you do outside of baseball. It shows that you're actually interested in their lives and what they're actually doing, you know? And I feel like that's a big thing. Cause I feel like that's something that could go a long way with them. That's something that I've uh, strived to do since grad school. I, I've got players from grad school who I still keep in touch with. I'll still text. Um, actually, just yesterday, went bowling with one who was visiting his friend in Texas, happened to be here. And he shot me a text. Okay. He's like, hey, you want to do something? And um, That's awesome. I mean, even like parents of, of uh, players, I still keep in touch with see how their family's doing. I've got, I've had moms who are like, oh yeah, so, so and so, you know, got engaged a couple, like a week ago. I'm like, great, I'm gonna have to shoot him in text and say congratulations. Um, so it, yeah, this isn't like a new thing, but it's it's also not just showing them that we're interested in their life, but it's also showing that when they're done playing, we're still gonna be interested. I try to tell them like, once I'm your coach, I'm always your coach. Even if I leave or you leave, if you graduate, you go to another team, I still wanna know how you're doing. Like one of my favorite parts of being a coach is not just helping them succeed on the field. It's helping them succeed off the field. Uh, especially when I was a college coach, getting to talk to guys about going to grad school, um, you know, getting different jobs. Like I've had players who are interested in getting to baseball. So getting to see them, you know, live out their dreams. I bragged about, you know, players doing amazing things. There's a player who works for NASA, another one who oh, wow. works for the military. And like, it's, it's awesome getting to see it, especially because I tell guys, I tell people, I mean, these players are smarter than me. So getting to see them do all these amazing things is so cool. And getting to know that I I had even like a small part in, you know, even if it's just their baseball career. But uh, again, like guys that are interested in going to law school or business school, especially, I definitely reach out and like, hey, let me know when you're ready to apply or take the LSAT or take the GMAT and GRE. I want to help you out. So um, yeah, it's, it's really important to me that guys know, like, we're not just seeing them as baseball players. Like we are seeing them as humans and we know that there's, there's going to be things outside of baseball that matter to them. Um, I mean, there's, especially cause you know, once they, once they're done with baseball, that's something athletes also struggle with is just their identity. Cause they're so used to just being athletes. Like what are they outside of baseball? And I think that's really important too. And that's one of the reasons why as a coach, you try to keep in touch with them even after because you want to help them with that transition too and help them like now that you know you know their family you know what type of person they are you can help them transition after baseball and help them you know succeed after as well 
Yeah, that's such a good point, though, too, because so much of their lives are consumed with baseball when they are playing baseball. And a lot of times, you know, they have all these other interests outside of baseball. We just don't really know what those are because, you know, baseball is really their their main thing at that point. And they're so focused on their career and trying to grow their career as an athlete. But what about all that other stuff that they just like to do in their free time that like, you know, <laughs> sometimes people I feel like forget that athletes are human beings too, and have their own interests outside okay. of their sport. And people don't always think about that either, because we only really see them as athletes. But at the end of the day, when they're when they're not playing baseball, like I know, like some athletes are always talking on Twitter, about like playing video games with each other and like all this other fun stuff that they just do that you people wouldn't don't even really think about that stuff that it's like yeah when they're not playing baseball like they're regular people that you know just have other interests outside of the sport you know what I mean oh that's that's something I can definitely relate to them because the number of people who seem shocked that I have an interest outside of baseball is astounding like I said before like I'm a huge Disney fan I love anime like to the point where I will dress up for like Comic-Con. I am a huge, I call myself a nerdy geek. So I'm not a nerd. I'm a geek. And there's a difference between the two. And I have no, I love being a self-proclaimed geek, but like Marvel, DC, I've got the comics. I have all the movies. I've seen them all. I'm huge into Harry Potter. Like I'm wearing a Disney like stitch button up already from Lilo. <laughs> So like, there's, I've got so many different interests. Also, like I'm reading, writing. I actually like, I write for fun. I love karaoke. I'm mean, like, there's so many things that I love doing outside of baseball that people seem shocked that I have like an intense passion for other stuff. So that I can definitely understand. Cause that's, yeah, you get to find by what you do and people don't necessarily think about all the other stuff. Yeah. And that's why it's, that's why it must be really cool for you to, um, well, obviously you follow them on social media, so you kind of see what they're doing outside of baseball, but just in general, just being able to like learn about them outside of the sport, because there's so much more to them than that. And you having those direct relationships with them, you can like, you can really learn those little things about them. Like, oh, this guy really likes like, I don't know, hiking or like this guy likes to read in his free time. Like that's all stuff that like you would know that just somebody who just looks up to them as an athlete wouldn't know something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's really cool too. Um, no, that's, that I, that's definitely like, I think the way that you have that close relationships with your players is probably one of the biggest reasons why they are, you know, able to be as successful as they are. Cause they know that you're going to be there for them no matter what, you know, when they're going through hard times and, or when they're succeeding, whether that's on the baseball field or off the baseball field, you just want to see them be successful in life no matter where that takes them after their baseball career is over. No, nah, it's true. I mean, like I said, that's what we strive to get through to players. And some guys, it takes a little bit longer than others. Some guys immediately kind of pick up on it. But um, that's probably the ultimate goal outside of, you know, helping them become better baseball players. Um, like I said, trying to be obsolete as a coach, but really just kind of being there for them. Yeah, definitely. We all need that kind of support, you know, like we all need people like that in our lives that we know that they're there for us, um, you know, regardless of um, what our path ends up being, like what we end up being successful at, that we have people like that. So it's like you're yeah, not only a coach, but you're like also there as like just a support system for them, too, and somebody that they can just come to about things and hopefully somebody that they'll stay in touch with, you know, for years to come after they're done with baseball, I would hope. Yeah, same. <laughs> um, yeah. So what, what, what's kind of like your biggest piece of advice for somebody who, you know, might be um, trying to go on the same path as you and kind of end up, um, you know, where you are today? Uh, don't give up and ignore the haters. I mean, definitely don't give up. It's not an easy path at all. Um, mine was definitely a winding path. It's certainly not traditional. Uh, you're not going to find a lot of baseball coaches with a law and a business degree. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> granted, I had a slightly different plan at the time. Yeah. But even when I decided I wanted to be a coach, I mean, it was very difficult finding people, one, who would take me seriously. Um, but then even the ones who supported me, just finding a coaching position where I could make a living or even a coaching position where I could also find a part-time job that was flexible enough for me to be able to do it. And 
there aren't many part-time jobs that are also flexible that also pay enough for you to pay for an apartment, no matter how cheap it is. So it's like, there was a part where there was a point in my life where I had to work seven part-time jobs just to work a volunteer coaching position. Wow. I could get some coaching experience because that's also the thing. Like it's hard to get experience when you can't afford to not be paid. And there's so many people who would probably make great coaches. You just, you can't afford to take that route. And thankfully I had family, like my parents were incredibly supportive financially, emotionally. Like there are times where I would break down because I was just so stressed out and my dad would just listen to me. So like, yeah, he was my coach essentially. Um, but at the same time, like I'd say, if this is something you really want to do, don't give up, find ways to make it work. Cause I think that's another thing that a lot of people fail to do is they, again, think of this one path and think they have to follow that one path where it's not true. Like, create opportunities for you. My first, actually, yeah, my first real position in baseball, uh, I guess technically second, because I worked for the Dartmouth baseball team, but like my position at Case Western, director of baseball operations that turned into also graduate assistant coach. That position didn't exist until I got there. Like I created that position with the coach and I expanded it. Like when I first got there, it was just helping out with basically, you know, logistics and then I started doing statistics during games. And then I started helping out on the field with drills. And then I started throwing batting practice. And like, you create positions for you. And then like when I was with the Reds, my internship was baseball ops. But I also got to work out. I got to work on the field with the players and the coaches about halfway through. And that's because I went down myself, took notes during batting practice. And one of the coaches noticed me. So you create opportunities for yourself when there aren't any. So that's a big one too. And it's going to take sacrifice. Another reason why I say don't give up. I've lost friends who weren't happy that I spent so much time focused on baseball. Um, but I've also discovered like when you surround yourself with the right people, it doesn't matter. Like the ones who will support you, they're not going to care. Like they're going to, they're going to want to see you succeed. And then um, as far as ignoring the haters, like I half the time, I don't pay attention to what people say. Um, because if they matter to me, they're going to be supportive of me anyway. And the ones who usually have some kind of critique, unless it's my supervisor telling me that I need to change something, if it's a random person, like they have no idea who I am. They have no idea of my life. They have no idea what I've done. So, I, And they have no effect over what I'm actually going to do. So why should I care what they think? And then others, sometimes I use it as fuel. I hear If I hear somebody say, tell me that I can't do something, a lot of the times it's going to make me want to try. And even with like friends, I've had um, a coach I've worked with. This is hilarious. I kind of hope he listens to this now because he'll remember this. <laughs> I had a coach I worked with where we were throwing, um, we were working with uh, hitters and plyo balls. And I threw one really, and I was actually throwing overhand because I have this thing where I, once you get to a certain point, even with plyo balls, I want them to see the overhand motion. So I was throwing one overhand. I threw it so soft, it ended up diving. And he joked with me. He's like, did you just throw a curveball with the plyo? I was like, no, I just threw it really soft. And he goes, yeah, I guess you wouldn't be able to do that because there aren't any seams. And I grabbed a, a plyo ball, and I'm just looking at it going, huh. Now I kind of want to see if I could throw a curveball with the plyo. And he's like, why did I say that? <laughs> I know you're going to try. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, like, I, try, really to, funny. I try to use that as – um you know, just fuel to get better. Even people, I'll be honest, like when I first got this job, I saw plenty of the comments of people asking, you know, why am I qualified to take this job? And I had friends, I had family, I even had players who were offended on my behalf about that. Like I had guys coming up to me saying, yeah, we were in like Instagram and Twitter battles over what people were saying. I'm like, guys, it doesn't matter. I don't really care. But yeah. I'm going to be honest, like I actually, a lot of those comments, I didn't really blame because- a lot of the posts that came out didn't actually say what I did. So, I mean, it was kind of like that kind of stuff just makes me want to go, okay, great. Now I'm going to be even more qualified and show people why I'm qualified, why I'm good at this, like why I deserve to have this job. So use like, yeah, those kind of critiques, use it as fuel to get better. And not only will it prove people wrong, you become a better person and a better coach at the same time. So it's kind of a win-win. 
<laughs> yeah, because you're instead of letting that stuff bother you and be like, oh, I should just, you know, quit now. Um, you use that to be like, OK, well, like, I'll really show you why I am qualified and why I deserve to be in this position. And like, it just makes you want to be better. Yeah. And like, I, I mean, at least for me, I always want to be better. Like, I want to be the best coach that I can be. But I also just want to be the best coach. Like, I love being competitive. I, I was a former athlete. That's that never goes away. Like, even with our players, you can ask a lot of my players. I love being competitive with them. Really? So we might have regular. So, yeah, my my last position at Carroll, we um, we didn't do regular feel good BP when we were in the cages at practice. We did uh, simulated at bats. So they came in and had an at bat against me where I was actually throwing different pitches and if they struck out swinging was 10 push-ups, strike out looking was 20 push-ups. We oh contact was 10 push-ups. If I walked them, I did 10 push-ups. So it was, <laughs> it was a constant competition. That's so funny. And we both loved it. I mean, that's, that's what the game is. And that's kind of the same thing for me, just as a coach, I am always in competition with myself. I want to be better than I was the day before, because not only does it make me better, I help my players get better when I get better and then vice versa. When they get better, I start getting better too because I'm learning from them just as much as I hope they're learning from me. So that's the kind of mindset that like helps you get through those things. Because yes, you might be you know trying to prove people wrong, but at the same time, you're bettering yourself. Yeah, and, and having that competitive aspect, I feel like you can't be successful you know, doing a, a job like you do without being competitive and without wanting to get better because you know, like you said, it's that team effort of like, everybody's getting better with each other. The more that everyone improves, the better everyone as a whole is going to be. And so everybody needs to have that mentality of, you know, what can I do to get better today? Like actually someone I work with, um, shout out to him, great guy, actually like has this phrase that he always tells everyone like, like, what can you do to get 1% better every day? Like he's like, it doesn't have to specifically be in your job. It can be something in like your lifestyle, just like, you know, the way you live your life, like what can you just do in general to make your life 1% better every day? And ever since he told me that I've been like, just thinking about that and using that in my head and be like, okay, what can I do today to change something I did yesterday to get like a little bit better each day? Yeah. And I feel like that's a really similar mentality from what you were just describing, you know? Yeah. And it's also something you want to try to preach to your players too, because you want them to have that same mentality. Like, how can I get better every day? Because again, you're making yourself better, but you're also, like you said, you're helping your team get better when you get better. So it's, you're helping everybody when you're trying to also get better. And like, you're in competition with yourself to consistently improve. Yeah. And also, you know, in, in, in with the players you work with, yeah, I mean, them constantly getting better every day will, you know, really help them get to that end goal of where they're trying to go. And so they need to constantly have that attitude every single day when they wake up, like, what can I do to improve today so that they can reach their goals at the end of the day, you know? Yep. Um, and continue to just, just keeping, just continue to grow each and every day and, you know, maybe changing something each day, even if it's small, it can really make a big difference is what I'm finding. And that just applies to life in general. Yeah. Like you never want to be stagnant. And like I said, when things get easy or things don't get like you don't improve, it tends to get boring. Like <laughs> I it's it's boring when life is too easy because then you're just kind of drifting through it. Yeah. You're just kind of going through the motion. Able, yeah. The fun is being able to face a challenge, problem solve, and then solve that problem and like, and, you know, achieve some kind of goal, like just something, even if it's hard, it's whenever you finally get to that point where you've achieved that goal, it feels amazing and it's worth it. Like that's the fun in life is to face those challenges. Yeah. And that, yeah, exactly. Cause facing those challenges and learning how to overcome them is what's really going to help you improve as opposed to just staying within your comfort zone and doing the same things every day. And then you're just going to stay in that one place, but having to face those challenges and really figuring out how to get through those, it's what's going to help you grow as a person and just in life with whatever it is that you're doing, you know, yeah. you get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And once you're finally at that point, challenges don't really phase you because you're used to it. Yeah. You're just like, okay, I can, I can figure this out. Like, I, yeah. you know, I've, I've gone through things before like this. So like I can figure out how to get through this and it'll be okay. Yeah. 
being able to tell yourself that it's going to be okay, I feel like is a big thing too. Instead of just giving up and being like, oh, I can't, I can't do this. I can't deal with it. You which, know, which brings us back to the whole mental part of the game. Yep. Yeah. If you've gotten to that point, then those are the players that succeed where they face a challenge on the field. And they're like, okay, I can face this. I can deal with this. I can handle this. Yeah. It all comes full circle, really. It, it really all does. Um, no, I really appreciate you joining me on the show. Um, this was awesome. I, I uh, you know, I really like enjoyed, you know, reading a little bit about your journey when you got hired into your current position. So I'm really, really, I appreciate you taking the time to, you know, speak with me. I hope you have, you know, a great holiday with your family as well. And everybody else who's listening, I hope you guys have an awesome you know, end of the year and holiday season. Hope everyone stays healthy and uh, can just enjoy some, you know, well-deserved relaxation time and time with family. Um, Hope hope you all have a great rest of your week as well. I appreciate everyone tuning in um, to the show. This was awesome. Um, You know, Merry Christmas to you and your family. Well, thanks, Gabby. Thanks again for having me on. And yeah, happy holidays, everybody. (laughs) Take care.